Hello everyone, let me tell you about my new job. Since recently I have been hired to help becoming a worldwide supplier of butterfly and moth pupa internationally. That means if you ever visit a butterfly house or a butterfly garden, there's a small chance that some of these insects come from me. Welcome to the BPS log. BPS, aka Butterfly Pupa Supplies, is a company that collaborates with me, that aims to be a supplier of moth and butterfly pupa internationally. Our main customers are zoos and butterfly gardens. And today I'm going to share these experiences with you. Welcome to the first BPS vlog. First things first, as you can see, I received packages full of pupa. All of these are going to uh, hatch into butterflies and moths sooner and later. Just check this out, how many of them I have in my possession right now. All of these butterfly pupa were legally imported and farmed from the Philippines. I'll tell you more information about that later. Check out these beauties first. The first thing that I did was a health inspection. Here's the thing, all of these pupa are going to be mailed to customers. However, tropical butterflies can hatch very fast. When the butterfly tries to hatch inside the mail, its wings will not have the adequate room to expand and the animal will be crippled. That's why it is important to inspect the pupa and make sure they are not close to hatching. So how can you tell, you're probably wondering. Well, the trick is to take a careful look at the pupa and notice the dark ones. Can you spot a dark butterfly pupa? You see, when a butterfly starts forming inside the pupa and its body starts growing, the pupa becomes less transparent as the liquid content becomes solid. This turns the pupa dark and eventually the shell will begin to dissolve, which will make it easier for the butterfly to escape when it wants to, causing the contours of the adult butterfly to shine through. Here, let me show you the difference. These are the same species, just developed and undeveloped. Can you see it? It's easy to see, right? It doesn't require much of an expert. So the first step was a lot of fiddling with butterfly and moth pupa. Of course, you are curious about the species that I have here. You see, the pupa that are not fit for shipping or selling, I will hatch them into butterflies myself for quality control to check if the animals hatch in the, into healthy adults and see if it is good and healthy livestock. These pupa right here are of the Papilio palinurus, the emerald swallowtail. This beautiful butterfly from Southeast Asia has beautiful bright green, metallic iridescence. Their native food plant is Euodia from the Rutacea family. It is somewhat related to citrus, for example. In my opinion, this is one of the most beautiful swallowtails there is. Fun fact. Their scales actually reflect yellow and blue wavelengths, which visually combine into the green that we see right now. Another thing of beauty are these spiky pupa of the red lacewing, Satosia biblis. They have spines and small golden patches. The red lacewing is also an incredibly beautiful butterfly with intricate patterns on, intricate patterns on their wings. Just look at it, wow. These lay eggs on certain types of passiflora. And these amazing golden pearls are the pupa of the paper kite butterfly, scientific name Idea Leucono. They are a relative of monarchs and lay eggs on the plant Parsonia among other things. Do you see these brown ribbed pupa? They are Pachliopterkotzebau. 
And these are the gothics of the butterfly world. They have pitch black uh, wings with red abdomens. They remind me of bats in some way. They are also toxic. And their red bodies warn predators not to eat them. As their food plant is the toxic pipe vine, Aristologia, the larvae sequester aristolochic acid with mayo, which makes uh, caterpillars and also the adult butterflies inedible to predators. I also had huge quantities of these Papilio memnon or Lowy. It's difficult to see the difference between these two species. And recently, Papilio memnon has invaded the Philippines, a species that used to be somewhat absent there, and now it's hard to tell. They lay eggs on several Rutacea plants, such as citrus and their relatives. Of this species, I had a huge quantity. It's also interesting to note their huge variety in colors. This species is very variable, and in captivity, a lot of specimens are unique looking. Not tired yet? Okay, have another. Here's Papilio rumansovia. A breathtaking species of swallowtail with a huge wingspan. They are mostly black with red accents on their underside and wing base. They also feed on Rutacea as larva. Now what happened is that I shipped a lot of these pupa to customers. Our biggest customers are butterfly farms. They require pupa in huge quantities for their displays. Much more than any hobbyist could ever buy. We ship internationally. Although you do need a permit to order them if you live outside of Europe. I'm sorry. It's illegal to exo order exotic animals if you live, for example, uh, in the USA or Russia or anywhere else outside of Europe. And it was a lot of work and seriously a lot of work and quite stressful to deal with so many orders at once and process them. I have problems with pan planning and organizing and this level of multitasking for me is extremely difficult. So, finally, I shipped my first load of packages. Phew, want to see more butterflies? Alright, here are the pupa of Graphium agamemnon. This tropical Asian swallowtail species lays eggs on Anonacea plants, such as Genus Anona. Their black wings with green spots are simply mesmerizing. Wow. How about the Hippolymnus bolina, the great eggfly? This common species lays eggs on various plants from the Urticaceae, Malvaceae, Acanthaceae and more families. They have beautiful iridescent patches of blue on their forewings that are shiny under certain angles. After shipping most of them, it was time for me to feed my babies. I usually fix them and feed them a mixture of honey and water, which they do seem to like a lot. This is what lunchtime truly looks like in my household. Oh, did you think we were finished yet? Oh, no, 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 new shipments just arrived. First of all, we have thousands of Atlas moth cocoons. Oh my God, so many cocoons. And all of them have to be shipped to the customers. So what species are they? The first are these yellow awesome beauties. These guys actually look like butterflies, but they are actually moths. They are a Geometridae from the genus Dysphania. I'm not sure if it's Dysphania militaris, but they are from the Philippines. Aren't they amazing looking? Last but not least, they are cocoons of the giant Philippinian atlas moth, Atacus lorkini. This is one of the biggest moth species in the world that I had to ship to customers. So Bart, why the hell are you transporting and importing so many butterfly and moth cocoons? Isn't that harmful for the environment? No, 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 no. Please do not imply or say that. First of all, I want to say, and I've said this before, I work in butterfly and moth conservation. 
I would not do anything that harms their populations in the wild. In fact, my whole channel and all my work is trying to promote and boost these animals and their status in the wild. And all of these animals are farmed by farmers in the Philippines. And this is actually good for the environment. So how does that work? First of all, you need to know that the Philippines is a developing nation. There are problems with poverty in the Philippines. And in a lot of developing countries, people, they, they choose to exploit their environment. If there's not many opportunities for you to work, then many people choose to burn down the forest and turn it into plantations for agriculture because, for example, they want to farm bananas or palm, palm oil or avocados or any food crops. This gives people food and work, but it's terrible for the environment. But the thing is, forests don't really have much for monetary value in that regard. However, it's the opposite if you are paid to farm butterflies and moths because you are essentially paid to, um, well, to keep these populations alive. Let's put it very simple. No forest means no butterflies means no job if you are a butterfly farmer. And that means that people in developing countries become financially dependent on conserving their environment. And this is very unique. And this is, how, this is what happens um, when people farm butterflies and moths. So in, from that perspective, it actually helps the environment. Second of all, all of these pupa and cocoons are not removed from the wild. They are farmed in captivity sustainably. They are not protected species. I would never uh, sell protected species without a permit. They are, all of them were acquired completely legally through customs. I have all the legal paperwork to own all of these. And if you think about it, from a humanitarian perspective, this is actually great because it gives poor people in developing nations work and an opportunity to develop without harming the environment. So that's a win-win situation. Now, I wouldn't go as far as saying that what I am doing is charity work or humanitarian work because that, is, that goes too far. It is not completely altruistic because obviously I am profiting from this work. I am profiting from this job. And um, uh, when you say, wow, I am doing development work, usually that's something you do without making a profit. But it is still a huge win-win situation. It's a win situation for the poor people in the Philippines. It is a win situation for the environment and the forests. In the Philippines, there's a lot of deforestation and pollution. And this work actually helps the good fight for insects. Um, I just need to get off the, my chest because every time I make a video where I breed a lot of insects, well, there, I always get a few of those commenters who say, "Why, but why are you owning so many animals? And why are you removing so many moths from the wild? They should be free. They should be in nature. They should be flying wild. Well, actually, uh, I give the hobby a lot of credit in uh, cultivating an interest in uh, butterflies and moths. They are not animals that most people would consider uh, thinking about or studying that closely. And I feel like butterfly farming and hobbyism, it, it, keeps, it puts people in, in touch with nature, uh, even if it means the animals have to be farmed in captivity. From my opinion, it's a great thing. Just take a look at my YouTube channel. I am one of the only people who is educating uh, thousands of people about butterflies and moths. There's a lot of scientists who wish they could have the same audience as me. And I am not doing it because uh, I am simply doing it because it's my hobby. Through breeding these animals in captivity, I spread a lot of awareness and uh, the good word for insects. So I am a huge, uh, I would say I would do a very good word for the hobby and the farming butterfly industry. Um, it's very important that you have, of course, the legal paperwork that you don't um, smuggle animals from the wild. I would condone that. Uh, those species are often collected from the wild and illegally obtained. But I have the permits to do all of this. And uh, yes, it's actually, this is very great. And I just ne needed to, to let you guys know, because there's always, always, always that guy in the comments, you know, that one animal rights activist who's like, why? It's cruel that you import so many thousands of insects and uh, blah, it hurts them and you should keep them free in the wild and dude I understand your perspective here but 
that's not really going to benefit anyone. Insects barely get any attention and any way that we can promote them and show people how nice they are, I think we should use that opportunity. Last but least, I want to say that on my channel, sometimes I uh, complain about animal rights activists, but I also want to say that I am actually a huge environmentalist and I generally support the animal rights movement. Um, I am not a vegetarian, I eat meat, so I guess that I also negatively contribute to the welfare of animals in some ways. Uh, that being said, I do think our current farming practices are wrong and I think we radically need to change the way we farm and keep animals. Uh, it should be happen on a less, in a, you know, on a, on a much smaller scale uh, with much more attention for the welfare of the animal. I'm not against eating meat, but I do think a lot of what we are currently doing is wrong. I also think it's so wrong that we are still eating wildlife and threatened species like uh, some people still feel the need to eat whale and I generally think animal rights activists that they are fighting the good fight but not when they come to my channel because the thing is that animal rights activists as good as their intentions are are usually the least educated people when it comes to biology and they think uh, insects is the same as mammals and it's not most animal rights activists are focused on mammals because they are the most charismatic animals uh, the most cute looking animals that give us, you know, the most empathic desire to protect them. Uh, for insects it's really completely different and it's, it is a bit annoying when people come to my channel with maybe good intentions in their heart, but who think insects are the same as mammals and need the same degree of animal welfare in captivity. I'm actually running a huge operation here with, um, on YouTube and social media but also in real life, I research them, I help in uh, conservation and it sucks that sometimes people who are uneducated attack me because they don't know anything about biology or entomology and they, they think that, um, that it's the same as wildlife trade. It is not. I uh, actually invite you guys to stay on my channel, watch some of my videos and try to understand what it is actually that I'm doing here. Uh, if you watch this video, you may think that I'm just a livestock supplier, which is true, it's one of my jobs. But I'm not, not just a guy who sells animals online, I am much more than that. And it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn here, and maybe I am. But I think it's very important to emphasize that fact, because people may misinterpret... misinterpret oh God, I hate my accent. Misinterpret what I am doing here, and the reason I am doing it. Um, my motive for doing this is not to get rich or make a lot of money. Although the sad truth is anymore, everybody needs money to live, everybody needs money to survive. And if I have to work, collaborate with butterfly farms to, uh, to help me grow and uh, pay for my channel, which is demonetized and make a living, then so be it. But my primary motivation is actually here to grow this social media thing into something big something positive that helps insects and if you watch my other videos you'll see that I've actually also worked with them in the wild I've done research uh, with them I've done biodiversity surveys so I'm I'm not really just a guy online hoarding animals and uh, it's important for people to understand but let's move on anyway it's just important for me that I uh, people get the correct image of me and the things that I do I don't want to promote animals as objects that you can buy. Although obviously I am also buying them and studying them, um, which is a huge part of my hobby. But I don't, I don't want to promote like a culture of animals as status symbols. Um, I think uh, education and hobbyism, however, are tied together. And I think a lot of professional entomologists, they don't give enough credit to hobbyists because hobbyists like me are actually doing a huge part of the, uh, of the conservation work. And uh, also the, um, you know, the, the, the educational part, the promoting of insects, because a lot of, a lot of average, you know, the, the average person doesn't really care about insects. And I also feel like not a lot of entomologists are good at directly communicating with the public about how beautiful and amazing they are. And I feel like uh, hobbyists, they, they, they fill this gap between the community and between the, the scientists. So um, 
And sometimes uh, that happens through showing how cool it is to breed them or have them as pets, which understandably may give off a, a incorrect message, but it's the first baby step into growing as an enthusiast, growing into, into someone who studies them and not just someone who does pet trade, you know? And um, oh, the money that we make, we invest it back in the butterfly farms and our butterfly farmers. And it's actually used for conservation work. Anyway, so all was looking well, right? I just started a new job with a new company and the sales were going well. Well, it was uh, until something bad happened. Because of the virus situation, I was stuck with an overdose of cocoons that cannot be sold. The coronavirus situation, which is an outbreak of a virus, a pandemic worldwide, that happened in 2020, that minute you're watching this video, it shut down all the market, all the touristic attractions closed, and our biggest customers are butterfly farms. So these cocoons could not be sold, and I was forced to hatch these guys into moths which is a huge financial loss. These moths only live for two weeks and cannot eat, however, so the chaos should not last that long. Still, it was a bit of a harsh and unexpected situation for me that I had to recover from. However, the good news is that this story about me and my moths went a little bit viral on the internet, so I got a lot of new sponsors for my channel, so that helps compensate me a little financially. These moths will be in good hands and I will do my best to continue their life cycle and give them the best care that I can pro provide for these animals. So now with all my exports shut down, I have to suspend my work for now. Despite that, I hope you enjoyed my vlog regardless. The good news is that this will force me to develop new hobbies such as drawing, which I am practicing right now. I'm totally new at this, but I would love to practice drawing insects and illustrate books about them. It also means that I now have not much to do except make YouTube videos for about three months. Last but not least, a gentle crowdfund reminder, since my channel is not supported by YouTube, unfortunately, since my work supports insects, I wish it was monetized. Although I am getting a lot of support from the community, so um, I don't have a reason to complain. I just have to include this message in the end of every video. Here it is. See you later, guys.